Shalom, this is Reverend John Ferret again, and we are in Lesson 73 in the continuing series, The Gospel According to Moses, and we're in the book of Genesis. So it's our Torah study from a Christian point of view. So here in Lesson 73, we are in Exodus, Exodus, Genesis, Lesson 30. And we find out that Jacob wants out. He wants to go home. He wants to go home with Rachel and Leah, his 11 sons, and Dinah, his only daughter. He's already served 14 years. He promised to serve seven years to get Rachel. And then what happened is Laban tricked him, deceived him. He marries Leah but agrees to work another seven years for his uncle Laban so that he could marry Rachel. Now he's telling Laban he wants out. Now we remember the situation where Jacob says that his wages will be the spotted sheep. This is going to be what we see in Exodus or in Genesis 31. And he works another six years in this process, and Jacob is really blessed. He keeps all the spotted sheep. And we'll take a look specifically at the method that he used. And indeed, it could very well be something that he believed was real. Uh, from all the Bible scholars, historical scholars I'm reading, it was a, <laughs> a wives, an old wives' tale. And it, it, it doesn't work. It, it's not a scientific method. But for Jacob and his culture, it's probably something he really believed did work. And he wasn't trying to trick. Wasn't trying to trick Laban at all. And this brings us to the important verse. Genesis 30, verse 33. We read, and so here's Jacob talking to his uncle Laban. So my honesty will answer for me later when you come concerning my wages. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, if found with me, will be considered stolen. His uncle Laban said, Good, let it be according to your word. Now, in the past we remember that Jacob deceived his father Isaac. And he was deceived by his uncle Laban. And it's as if Jacob sees his sin, what he's done in the past, and how a concept in the Bible really affected Jacob's life measure for measure. What goes around comes around. In other words, he, de he deceived his father and he was deceived. Now Jacob is saying, no, I'm going to live honestly. I'm going to live righteously. So later, I'll be treated in the same way. In Hebrew, it's midah keneged midah. In other words, measure for measure. It's a theme in Torah. One example is, if you recall, Moses tells Jethro, his relative by marriage, of God's amazing judgments against Egypt and the gods of Egypt. This is in Exodus 18, verse 8. Jethro is a pagan priest, a priest of Midian. He's amazed, declaring that Moses' is God must be God over all the gods. Why? He sees measure for measure. As Egypt tried to come against Israel, their evil was returned on them with plagues and the destruction of Pharaoh's army at the Red Sea. Jethro acknowledges this in Exodus 18, verse 11. He's saying, Yahweh is greater than all the gods. The implication here is that God is the one who brings Mida, Keneged Mida, measure for measure, and actually creates it as a 
truth condition among all human beings regardless of the religion but this takes us to jesus in the jewish culture in jesus's day in terms of their study of the scripture of which the torah the first five books of the bible the books of moses were the primary books they saw mida keneged mida measure for measure everywhere and like i said it's as if it was a condition of life established by god for all of us no matter our religion mida keneged mida measure for measure whether you're chinese french german native american spanish who cares mida keneged mida measure for measure whether you're a christian whether you are one practicing judaism whether you are a muslim a buddhist an atheist it makes no difference this is a concept that god has seemingly established jesus talks about this in matthew 7 verses 1 through 2 he says do not judge so that you will not be judged for in the way you judge you will be judged and by your standard of measure it will be measured to you mida keneged mida paul addresses this as well this is in galatians 6 7 and 8 paul says do not be deceived god is not mocked for whatever a man sows this he will also reap for the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption and the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap another uh, reap eternal life this is another powerful lesson you guys in god's torah god's instruction so come and study with me once again let's see how scripture all scriptures especially the torah testify of jesus just like he said in john 5 39 when he said scripture testifies of me implying all scripture that they had ready to go study come let's go Okay, it's time for Jacob to leave. He's had it. He's, I mean, he's had it right up to here. So let's take a look at Genesis 30, starting in verse 25. Genesis 30, starting in verse 25. And we read, Now it was, once Rachel had borne Yosef, that Yaakov said to Laban, Send me free, send me free, that I may go back to my place, to my land. I want out of here, okay? Give over my wives and my children for whom I have served you, and I will go. Indeed, you yourself know my service that I have served you. Lavan said to him, Pray, if I have found favor in your eyes, I have become wealthy, and Yahweh has blessed me on account of you. And he said, Specify the wages due you from me, and I will give you payment. He said to him, You, show your, you yourself know and how, how I have served you, and how it has gone with your livestock in my charge. But you had but few before me, and they have since burst out into a multitude. Thus has Yahweh blessed you at my every step. But now when I uh, when may but now when may I too do something for my household? He said, What shall I give you? Yaakov said, Nothing. Isn't that cool? Basically, you are not to give me anything. Only do this thing for me. Then I will return, I will tend your flock, and I will keep watch. Now let me just stop right there. He's had it. He's served for 14 years. He's done nothing for himself. He has been serving as a shepherd for Laban, okay, Laban. Now, he did not do this. This is servitude, okay? When you read in Leviticus, which we will get there someday, a person who owes money can actually make himself a servant. The, the, he, the Bible uses, well, the, Eng, the English is slave. No, he's not a slave, okay? He's an indentured servant until he pays off his debt. 
Jacob doesn't own Levon anything. He basically said, you want Rachel? Seven years. Okay? Great. By the way, it was Leah. He wakes up. He said, wait a minute. You tricked me. Okay? Measure for measure. Okay? You deceive your father. Now you're going to get deceived. So what has Laban said? Fine. You can have her too, but you need to work another seven years. Okay? So it's 14. This is 14 years later. Okay? Now it's interesting. Levon doesn't want to let this guy go. This, this is the goose who laid the golden egg. You're not going to let Jacob. Lavan has, has proven to himself, Laban has proven to himself very sneaky, devious, and also money hungry and very selfish. He, no way does he want the goose to take off. He knows he owes Jacob. And he says, I'll give you just wages. You know, stay with me. I'll give you just wages. No problem. Jacob bought nothing. He has Rachel, he's got Leah, he's got 11 sons and a daughter. Little does he know that Benjamin is going to be born on their way to back home. He only asked for one thing, and that's in verse 32. This is fascinating, and there is something in verse 32 that you need to read. I never saw this before, and again, that's why I thank the scholars who helped me understand this in a deeper way. In verse 33, there's a statement here where Jacob, and we'll talk about the sheep here in just a second, but he said, I'm going to be honest, and may, honesty, may my honesty plead for me on a future day. Can anybody out there read for me? Now, D Dave, I know you got Fox's translation. Uh, does anybody have a different translation in verse 33 like I said, mine says, and may my honesty plead for me in a future day. Can anybody please help me with what your Bible says? What version do you have, Joe? What version do you have? ESV. Okay, what does the ESV say there? So my honesty will answer for me later when you come to look into my wages with you. Okay, anybody else? That's actually even better. Okay. NASB. Yeah. So my honesty will answer for me later when you come concerning my wages. Okay, anybody else? That's NASB, ESV. Anybody else with a different one? Well, the wrong translation? Yeah. And my right doing must answer for me on whatever future day you may come to look over my wages. You know what that is? Measure for measure. He's saying, I'm going to be righteous, and I'm going to live righteously, and that's going to answer for me in the future because my righteousness will return to me. That's measure for measure. He's saying, if I live righteously, I'm expecting, obviously, to have a blessing in return. Not a blessing, per se, money or something, but my righteousness will come back on me. Now, listen to Jesus. Matthew 7, 2. Matthew 7, 2. Jesus says this, Actually, let me do Matthew the 7, 1. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. That's measure for measure. Whatever you do, okay, will come back to you. For in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard or measure, it will be measured to you. That's measure for measure. What is the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's measure for measure. Because if you're going to do good things to people, love them, care for them, okay, that will return to you. I don't know how, okay, that's not the prosperity gospel. That's living in God's kingdom. I don't know how he does that. Prosperity gospel is make sure you send the prayer, prayer rag in to the preacher who's on the television and send a $1,000 uh, donation and you will make sure that you'll get $10,000 and a car in return. That, that's not measure for measure, okay? That's stupidity. So, Jacob is relying on measure for measure. So here's what he's going to do. He said, and this is honest, he's not playing a trick. He said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Lavan, I'm using this on purpose. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go over to the flock, and I'm going to remove every speckled and dappled head. I think striped is, what do you guys have? This is verse 32. I have removing every speckled and dappled head and every dark head among the lambs. 
Spotted and speckled. Spotted, okay, dappled. Okay, I got it. And every dark head, or in other words, any black lamb or even the goats. That's what I get. That's what I want. Okay. And then later on, it will say, uh, in verse 34, Lavan said, good, according to your words, I got it. And then what's really fun is, um, let's see if I can find it. Yeah, in verse 35, since you're reading this in English, Moses uses a play on words. Lavan is Laban, okay? And Lavan, if you actually pronounce it with the different vowel points, it's Lavain. Pronounce, it's written exactly the same, just pronounced differently. Lavan, Lavain. And on that very day, he removed the streaked and dappled goat, uh, uh, he goats, and every spackled and dappled she goat, every one that had any, that had any Lavain on it, and every dark one in the lamps, and handed them over to his sons. Um, is that the verse? Hang on just for a second. Verse, and it's verse 35. So what happens is this. Any lamb or goat that was white was called Levain. It's like Laban had his name on it. It's very interesting, the play on words there in the Hebrew. It's, it's, it's cute. Okay, I, so you have to talk to Moses about that, but I think Moses is being a little cute here. Now Jacob's plan is this. This is really fascinating. He is not being dece he's not deceiving. He's a shepherd. And he's living in a pagan society. And everybody in the ancient Near East says that if you do this procedure, and the procedure that we have in here, let me go into it. There's a specific name for it. Jacob here institutes what is known as maternal impression process. That is, he acts on the common belief that a vivid sight during conception or pregnancy will leave its mark on the offspring. Jacob thus takes peeled branches and lays them in the watering troughs where the flocks come to water and to mate. The result is that the females of the flocks give birth to young that have the color of the sticks. Is there any evidence that such a prenatal influence theory has any basis in fact? Has it been scientifically proven to work? Absolutely not. It's a superstition, it's a myth, okay? It's an old wives' tale. Now, what you need to understand is Joko, uh, Jacob is not deceiving Laban. He's taken what's his, yes? He's not stolen. Laban said, there, there they are. So he thinks this is going to work. So he goes through this process, this old wives' tale, to increase his flock, so he would get rich. And doggone it, it works. It did. Verse 43 of chapter 30. The man burst forth with wealth exceedingly. He became very rich. Matter of fact, as you go into 31, he became richer than Lavan. And Lavan got upset. He came to have many flock animals, maids and servants, and camels and donkeys. Amazing. Wait a minute. This is an old wives' tale. What's going on? Now, there's a number of points of view in here because we have a problem. Right at this point, it worked. You can't dismiss it, right? However, later on, in chapter 31, he's talking with Rachel and Leah. And he said, I had a dream. And God came to me in the dream and said, all the speckled and striped and black sheep are yours. In other words, God did it. One rabbinical opinion is that God, the angel of the Lord, actually came to Jacob and said, this is how you're going to do it, to actually use this process. So there is one rabbinical opinion that says God taught him how to do that. Well, the Torah doesn't say that, but it's legitimate. That could be a way. I look at it differently, and I say, I have no problem with Jacob. All of a sudden, remember they were doing mandrakes? God put a stop to that. Okay? Now, Jacob is still doing superstitious stuff. He thinks it's going to work. Every shepherd would have done the same thing. You say, well, how am I going to increase my flocks? And it worked. But then later on, in the dream, God comes to him and says, uh-uh. 
I did it. Superstition, gone. So that's what Jacob actually thought. I'm going to go back to Crete again. In Genesis 31, verses 10 through 13, you can read about his conversation in there. Matter of fact, I'm going to read it from Kareed's. Genesis 31, 10 through 13, from his book. And it says, And it came to pass when the flock was in heat, and I lifted my eyes, and I saw in a dream that, behold, the male goats that were mating with the flock were striped, speckled, and spotted. Then the angel of God said to me, now let me just stop there. Remember, it says, this is the angel of the Lord. Who's the angel of the Lord? God. We've proved that already. Okay? The God, so God is speaking to him, Jacob, and I said, here I am. Then he said, now lift up your eyes and see that all the male goats mating with the flock are striped, speckled, and spotted, because I have seen all that Laban has done to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and where you avowed a vow to me. Now arise, go from this land, and return to the land of your birth. So all of a sudden, this is after, and Jacob says, holy cow, I thought it was that, you might say that superstition that worked, but it wasn't. In this, his continuing conversation, as Dr. Kareed writes, uh, with his wives, Jacob reports that God has appeared to him in a dream. God reveals to him that it was his providence that has been behind Jacob's success with the animals. In other words, it was not Jacob's stratagem, but the providence of God, which had prevented him from falling a victim to Laban's avarice and had brought him to such wealth. God is saying it wasn't the old wives' tale, it was me. Now look at this. He acted righteously. He didn't lie. He didn't trick to Laban at all. And what happened? He tried honestly to use a superstition, and God had to put that aside. He wants to get rid of that from his people. And again, here's what happens. He was acted honestly, and God actually blessed him. Now, that does not mean all of you, okay, should get some sheep, and do this and act righteously so that God will increase your herd. All I know is this. We do not know God's plan for us. For me, I plan and I'm focused in on what am I going to do this spring? You guys are saying, well, when are you going to advertise for term number four for this class? I don't know. Will this class happen? I have no idea. All I know is in January 2019, I'm teaching at Legacy Christian Academy. I've got high school students with me three hours a day for a week. I'm excited. But what am I going to do? I have no idea what's going to happen. I'm meeting with two gentlemen for breakfast or lunch, okay, this week, and we'll be talking about things that are going to happen here at this church on Sunday mornings, or maybe other things. We don't know. We just see what the Lord has for us. So that's definite. That's, I know legacy, and I know our meeting. So I don't know what's going to come of that. We'll just see what the Lord does. After that, I have no idea. They want me to teach down in the southern suburbs. They want me to teach in the northern suburbs. They want me to teach in the central suburbs. People here are saying, why aren't you teaching here a different class besides this one? Everybody wants me to teach everywhere. I, I don't know where I'm going to go. What will really happen, I really don't know. But I'll tell you this, I'm going to live mida, keneged mida, measure for measure. I'm going to trust in him, I'm going to try to live righteously before him, and I'm going to rely on the following verse. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Matthew 25, Matthew 6, 25 through 34. For this reason I say to you, John, <laughs> it doesn't say John, but I want to put that in there. For this reason I say to you, John, do not be worried about your life as to what you'll eat or what you're going to drink, nor for your body as to what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? Stop. What did I just tell you about the worth of a woman and a man? What is Rabbi Isaac in the 15th century teaching us? The same thing. 
And here's Jesus teaching the same thing prior to Rabbi Isaac. And who of you, by becoming worried, can add a single hour to your life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you, not even, that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if so, God clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown in the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will I eat? What will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek these things. Stop. They want Rachel. This is the Rachel Leah story. This is the birth of Messiah. Is it Caesar you want? Or the baby in a rock bowl in a sheep cave? That's the dilemma. That's the choice. For Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Don't worry. All I know is this. The two gentlemen, my two brothers in the Lord, we're going to have this meeting. I don't know what's going to happen, but all of a sudden there's going to be this set of activities. And I'm going to sit back there and say, holy cow, we're going to do this. And I'm going to say, Lord, how, are you, how can I do this? And he'll say, don't you remember what you taught Sunday night? Do you really believe that what you really believe is really real? Do you really believe in measure for measure? Do you understand that the work that you're going to do at this church or any other places is my work? It's got nothing to do with you, and I will give you everything you need to get it done. That's not the prosperity gospel. That's he who has assigned my work, giving me everything I need to get the job done. And you guys, I tell you this over and over and over again, I can't believe what he does to me. This works. It really does. Amazing. So may it be that for us, that's our standard of measure. It's right there. Seek his kingdom and his righteousness. That's it. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Mida kaneged mida. Measure for measure. So as Christians, what in our view is a way that we would perceive mida connected mida measure for measure how does our life as disciples of jesus show this principle what goes around comes around it's very simple make sure jesus has first place in your life it's simple above all seek his kingdom and his righteousness seek nothing else and stand on this fact. Matthew 6, 32-33 For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Seek first. Let that be primary in your life. Everything else, put aside. And then all these things shall be added to you. measure for measure. Now in lesson, the next lesson we're going to do a review and it's good to stop to see where we've been <laughs> starting in Genesis 1 where we are. Jacob is ready to go home with his family and where we're going. And again we're going to see in our review that there is a problem in Genesis looking for a solution. The problem is in Genesis 6-5 and then again in Genesis 8-21 God says that for us, mankind, men and women, young and old, that our hearts are inclined to evil continually. And remember, hearts, it's not our heart, it's not emotions, it's not feelings. Heart is a picture for the mind. That's that Hebrew concept. So when you read heart, it really means mind. That our minds are inclined to evil continually. All of us. All of us fall short in God's eyes. Nothing we can do can solve this. We're trapped. 
But God loves all mankind. He wants all to be saved. But not just saved. Yeah, God is love. And he brings us love. But just as we chose to turn against him, he wants us to actually make a rational, intelligent choice to come back to him. So he comes to Abraham. And through Abraham, all of us will be blessed by Adonai. God plans, takes us to his coming. When God came to create a solution, when God came to bring a cure to the cancer that's in us, and his cure is himself, Jesus, and the cross. Jesus said it is finished. Yes. He says that in John 19, verse 30, Jesus' life is finished. His ministry is over. His work is done. His work? Yeah, it's He is the joyous hope for all mankind. Where there was a problem that began in Genesis, we finally come to the cross for the cure and the solution and the hope realized in Jesus. Now we can choose him. And God forbid that you do not choose him. But if we choose him, we're blessed with the way back to the Father. The cross is the climax. It's the conclusion. It's where we're going. All scripture targets Jesus and the salvation of God through him. So Jesus was speaking correctly in John 5.39 that scripture testifies of him. All he had was the Old Testament then. All Torah. All Torah is targeting Jesus and the cure. So I will see you in Lesson 74 as we do a brief review that I think you're going to find fascinating. Yevarech Kenu Adonai Veshmar Kenu Yair Adonai Panav Aleinu Vekun Kenu Yisa Adonai Panav Aleinu Vyasem Lanu Shalom Veshem Yeshua Adonainu Amen May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and may he give us his shalom in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen.